Hello, everybody. Hi, hello, hello, hello. Hi. How are you today? You might be wondering where I am. I'm coming to you live from the Aish World Center in the heart of Jerusalem, one Western Wall Plaza across from the Kotel. I actually wanted to stream tonight from the rooftop, but the wind was a little bit windy and the Wi-Fi signal was just a teeny bit spotty. And I wanted to make sure that nothing interrupted or interfered with the most amazing show we have today. And one of like, a dear friend and one of our special guests. And so because of that, I came down into, this is known as the Hall of Notes, this room. And so there's a beautiful screen here. And this is what people see uh, before they go ahead and they write their notes here before they head out to the Kotel, to the Western Wall and to put their prayers into the wall. So I'm sitting here in the Hall of Notes. We can't wait to welcome you back to the H World Center, God willing, when the skies open sometime soon. But in the meantime, this is Feed Your Soul. And we have an amazing guest today. So let me tell you all about him. Jake Cohen is a cookbook author and nice Jewish boy from New York City, a former food staffer at Savor, food editor of Tasting Table, restaurant critic of Time Out New York, and editorial director of The Feed Fee. Jake just wrote his first book, Jewish, about his love of modern Jewish cooking and baking. Thank you so much. Someone just brought me a special drink for the second part of the show, and I can't wait to share it with Jake. Jake, welcome to Feed Your Soul. Hi, I'm so, so excited to be here. Me too. First of all, Jake, you have been on a world tour with this book, the Today Show, a local TV, national TV. Have you been to Jerusalem yet? Not, I mean, I've been to Jerusalem in the past, but I not for this. I your book tour. No, this is the first time. I'm so excited. Obviously, I have to save it for you. No better person to welcome me. I so badly, Jake, wanted to do this from the rooftop. I was telling everyone before with the hotel, the Western Wall behind me as the sun was setting, but it was gets windy up there a little bit and the yeah. Wi-Fi was a little spotty. And I just wanted nothing to interrupt this amazing show because everyone is excited to have you. We're also looking forward to this. How are you feeling? Like what a whirlwind this book has been. Yeah, it's been a lot. It's been very emotional. <laughs> I think it's been really incredible. I, I think it's such a blessing to be able to write a book. It's such an incredible um, book that features so many stories of my family, my relationship, our blendings of, of an Ashkenazi family and yeah. a Mizrahi family. Um, yeah. and, and to see it go out into the world and see it kind of a new generation of young Jews relate to it um, and help inspire really like this preservation and the celebration of Jewish food on the every day. To me, that's the most meaningful part of the whole process. Well, I feel like this show, Feed Your Soul, was made for you and made for projects just like this. There's so much I want to talk to you about, but let's start with cooking first. Yes. So we are making Iraqi almond cookies. Say it loud, say it proud. What are these called? So these are called hajibata. This is a recipe I learned from my husband's great, great aunt um, who mm. brought to me, scribbled on a little piece of paper, and it's a very classic chewy almond cookie that is like perfumed with rose water kosher for Passover, but also just like a delicious gluten-free cookie for any time of the year. And it's so easy to make. First so of all, we you. love that. But I love that you actually got it scribbled on a piece of paper. Usually those recipes that are passed down are just told. And then like yes. something's lost in the game of telephone and you're never like, that's not how it tasted. That's not how my mother, my grandmother, my great grandmother made it. So how lucky are you? Truly, I mean, they all knew that I was on the hunt for these recipes to make sure that they were preserved just because of that. Yeah. So many yeah. of these Persian and Iraqi dishes my husband grew up with were just like, they're still being made by all of the, 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 the matriarchs. So yeah. not even my mother-in-law's generation knows how to make kubba or, or many of these mm -hmm. dishes because they don't have to. And that's yeah. the biggest fear is that they'll go away. So I wanted to make yeah. sure that everything was written down. And if that meant following these women with measuring cups and a scale to make sure it was all documented, <laughs> that was what I was going to do. Okay, so let's do it. So how do we get started? Starting very simple, we have two egg whites that I'm gonna throw in a cup of granulated sugar. So this reminds me kind of of the start of a macaroon, right? Uh, that's exactly. how we started, yes. The only difference is we're not making a meringue, we're really just looking to get things a little frothy. Right, I, I like that and I love that we have to pull out the stand mixer. I mean, for people that keep a strictly kosher for pasta Rome and they have to have a new, no one who wants a second stand mixer. And then for anyone in general who's just making this, like you said, any time of year, I also don't love pulling out my A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I couldn't agree more. And I think that like, obviously for Ashkenazis, I feel like um, K for P desserts, truly it's, there has to be meringue involved. So you really like, yes. you, need, you can't do it by hand. If you're going to do it by hand, that is your arm workout for the week, for the entire right. length of Passover. 
literally I said that it's like a pavlova, like by hand, forget about it. I don't even know if that's possible. So as you can see, it's nice and thick, a little foamy, but not like, we're not even getting to, to soft peaks. We're really just yeah. getting it nice and incorporated. It's going to work down that sugar. And then you just have a few more ingredients. We're flavoring this up with a tablespoon of rose water. I adore rose water. I think the more floral, the better. Um, that being said, I, I, uh -huh. let's say you are, you have family, but people who are like, uh, not so into rose, you can right, totally right. Yeah. swap in orange blossom water, vanilla, Beautiful. play around I with the that. extracts. I love that. You know, it's so funny. I think it's kind of like an acquired taste and those that love it are obsessed with it. Right. And those that don't, it's like, it's a bit offensive almost. So I'm one of those, I'm the same camp as you. I'm obsessed with rose water. I love it in Malabi, for example, one of my oh, favorite yes. desserts. But I love the idea of orange blossom water, vanilla, or any sort of al almond extract, or you know, of maybe even brandies or liqueurs in there. Hunt, that would be delicious. And that's a, a perfect okay. example of this next part. So I'm adding in half a teaspoon of kosher salt and a half teaspoon of ground cinnamon. Traditionally, mm -hmm. with these cookies, you would often find cardamom. But just like you say, yeah. my mother-in-law hates cardamom. Will not have it. So many of these recipes, as I was preserving them, I would I would do my research and be like, oh well, this is supposed to have this, it's supposed to have that. Yeah. And it comes down to when when we talk about Jewish recipes, so often they're passed down and they're tweaked based on individual people's tastes. So for if I hadn't done that research, I would just assume and future generations would just assume that like there's no cardamom in this dish and Correct. not that it's because Rabina doesn't like it. <laughs> Isn't that you know, it's so funny, it's so hysterical because Every time I make something, whether it's something classic, let's say a potato kogol or like you said, hajibada, and someone says, that's not how you make it. That's not how my mother made it. Well, maybe because they just didn't like cardamom, but really, you know, that's what's, what's classic. So I think that there's always that kind of sort of fight between that's not how my mother made it. That's not how you make potato kogol. So I love that you're finding the source and then you're noting where you can make sort of those flavor changes. For sure. And I always love to say authentic can only apply to one family at a time. Ah. Oh. Jake, I'm quoting you on that. I'm quoting yes. you on that. Okay, authentic can only apply to one family at a time. Now, what did you go ahead and just pour in there? I just threw in two cups of almond flour. Um, just, just nice almond meal. Great, you don't have to grind it yourself if you want to, mm -hmm. by all means. Um, but nice and fine is what you're looking for, right? Fine is key. I have it with the um, the blanched almond flour that doesn't have the skins. If you want to keep the okay, skins very on, nice. that's not the end okay. of the world either. Okay. I feel like nothing's really the end of the world after the year we nothing. went through. Right. Like almond skins. Ugh. Give me a break. <laughs> My favorite thing that I've been saying on this tour is I just think that we need to be normalizing Dayenu on the on a daily basis of like yes. whatever, oh. whatever it is, it's enough. Like it's like if you, yes. if you only have, if you only have uh, almond flour with skins, <laughs> Dayenu. If you don't have almond flour, don't make this recipe, Dayenu. Like you'll be totally. Fine. Oh, Jake, I love it. Love it. Okay, so I, I love that you're a bowl and a whisk and a spoon. I mean, nothing fancy here, which is how I like to cook on the regular and especially and bake on Passover. And this is done. That's it. Can you believe, like, this is, we just made the batter in, in just a few minutes. It comes together so quickly. Now I'm going to show you the Fabulous. secret, which is so, okay. so lovely, is how we roll these out. So I just have a little bowl and I put in a few drops of rose water. Um, and mm. some just cold water. You want to add okay. in that rose water because it's going to help add in a little more flavor. We're going to okay. scoop out tablespoon size little balls of it. And you want to use wet hands. So many dishes when we're making like, especially Middle Eastern food, wet yes. hands are the secret because it's the only yes. thing that prevents sticking. Yes. I, and it's funny. I just made literally macaroons earlier and I feel like I'm like, we're having, reliving my earlier demo. And I was talking about wet hands, even for the macaroons, when you're forming them rustic by hand. I also used wet hands or lightly oiled hands, Jake, for my matzo balls. hundred percent. Yes. Love yeah. that. So literally okay. I'm just rolling it and then you plop it down. Okay. And you're going for, oh, so it doesn't have to be a perfect ball. Like they want these to look a little bit handmade and homemade. Correct. Correct. You, mm -hmm. And you honestly, even if you didn't want to, you could just drop it. Um, right. At the end of the day, what I love to do is there's the secret where um, as soon as they come out of the oven, you take a little cookie cutter and you roll them around the edges and it smooths uh -huh. out and makes it into a perfect circle. Oh, very nice. But sometimes I love the idea of not perfection. I love that it looks like someone made it with love, like we were just speaking about a minute ago, and that mm -hmm. handmade, homemade look versus perfection. I feel like perfection is so like, I don't know, last century. Yeah. I just can't even. That's I'm, it. I'm we want over it. Rustic all the way.
Yeah. I actually was just looking at your feed um, a moment before and saw that you have this beautiful rustic, like a let on there or pie. Like, I love that. It just it looks like something Apple was about three posts ago. Yeah. I don't know if you remember what you posted. What is I that? Know. So it was, I have been trying to do a lot more acts of service. I think it's super important, especially in today's world. So typically mm -hmm. when any Jewish organization reach out, um, I try to do whatever I can. And I was reached out by a couple who unfortunately um, lost their first child. And now on her, the anniversary of her birthday, they have a, which is 314, they do a pie baking thing to raise money for the NICU at the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. Um, wow. So it, it was, and we did a bake along of this caramel apple galette, raised $37,000 wow. for underprivileged wow. families. Um, and to me, it's like, like that, that's, that it was just, that means the world to me. I think I always love to say, and again, you know, I like you know, I, I'm coming from a place where I am very modern. I quite unorthodox in the, a lot of the ways that I practice Judaism. Mm -hmm. A lot of the way that I do everything, but at my core, I think daily mitzvahs is like that's what my life is about. Well, wow. first of all, Jake, I do, and I think that you wear that on your sleeve and you share that, and I think that inspires so many people. And I have to say, you know, that story hits home for me in so many ways. But I'm from Philly. So Children's Hospital Philadelphia Chop, it's a world famous hospital for, for children. And so how amazing that you did that on behalf of my hometown and on behalf of that couple, absolutely unbelievable. Well, on a brighter note, it was yes. a really, really <laughs> incredible evening. Everyone had a great time in terms of baking. And I think baking is, is such an incredible form of, of self-care in this current moment. Yeah, so therapeutic, so therapeutic. Okay, so now we're pressing in a beautiful whole almond with the skin on. <laughs> yes, that's it. I love I love to kind of show people what's going to be inside. It's a really mm. nice just kind of little way uh, to dictate like, all right, you're having something that's almond. Um, yeah. And it's pretty and it has a little more texture. It's very chewy cookies. Um, uh -huh. And then we're going to bake these at 350 degrees for 15 minutes. Mm. Luckily, Wonderful. I already baked some in advance because yeah, they're so you're easy. Yeah, so good at naturally. this. Through the magic of television. Um, through the magic of television. I have to plate them up still, but I'm going to at least come up and show you the pretty versions just because they really are so stunning. Look at this. Oh, beautiful. So now I see you did go around with the cookie cutter, I'm guessing, because they're so yes. beautiful. Perfectly circle. I love that little like browning on the bottom. Yum. You're like, and yum. They're, they're, you break them off and they're so chewy and moist. Mm -hmm. The rose water, it's floral. It honestly kind of tastes like cereal milk, that combo of the nuttiness with the, the floral notes. I That's love it. That's so interesting. That's a really interesting you know, explanation of that. Um, I think that those are stunning. I love how easy it is to make. I can make a kosher or Passover recipe in an instant, or these are gluten-free, or if you love almonds year-round. So that is so fantastic. Jake, you just made my life so much easier. I mean, that's the goal. That is truly all of my work, this whole book, this book, the idea was I wanted I wanted Jewish inspired recipes that were full of flavor and that would come out delicious. But at its core, really, my approach to a lot of Jewish cooking is through like the concept of hosting people for Shabbat, through Jewish entertaining and hospitality right. and welcoming in the stranger. So to me, every recipe was with in mind of will this add stress to your life of making multiple recipes and hosting people, or will it make right. your life easier? And it's yeah. everything every in the same way of like does it spark joy like. Does it not add stress to the host? That's the goal. yes, complete. I always say a stressed out host makes is the is the worst kind of host, and your guests can read it and feel it, and it makes them feel unwelcome. It's like the antithesis of what you're trying to do in terms of being warm, welcoming, bringing people together, bringing people to your home. No one wants to feel like they were a burden. So if you do things that make your life easier, make hosting easier, you will do it more, and your guests will have they'll appreciate it, and have a better time, and they'll feel it. Right? Yes. Oh my God. But uh, yes, that's it. You put it so incredibly perfectly. Okay, so we have so much to talk about with you know about 10 minutes left to the show. I have a special beverage for this part. Tell me if you recognize what this is from the last time you were in Israel. Oh, that's the um uh I know what I it's it's just the ice like frap kind of yes. um what what is it, how do you call it? Ice coffee slushy. Ice coffee ice slushy. Coffee slushy. Yes, it's so literally good. like a 7-Eleven slushy, but it's yes. coffee. And every cafe, every bagel shop, every dairy restaurant, every um, pizza shop in Israel 
you go somewhere and you can get an iced coffee, but it's like this slushy, it's decadent, it's fabulous. And I wanted to bring a little piece of, you know, taste of Israel oh. to you while I was here in Jerusalem. So we just popped it on the way down to the hotel. I grabbed it. What are you drinking? So I, I don't actually drink alcohol, but I've gotten very into these um, Amaro sodas. So they're like these low calorie bitter sodas. I'm like, you know, weak Jewish stomach soda and bitters, classic, <laughs> my favorite. Um, so I've just been obsessed with, with having something a little bubbly, a little bitter, a little sweet. And it's, it's become just such a, a nice little treat. It sounds like perfect. A little bubbly, a little bitter, and a little sweet. And mine's a little slushy and a lot sweet and cool. Oh, <laughs> so and yeah. Give you a little jolt. We love it. Mm. Okay. So, Jake, you called your book Jewish. I was hoping that you were going to wear your nice Jewish boy sweatshirt. I'm cool. I'm happy to see you also. <laughs> oh, wait. Do you, do you want to see, see what I'm wearing underneath? Yeah, of course. Fashion moment. Oh, my God. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it, Jake. You wear Always your Judaism. Rapping. Yeah, you know, it's so funny because you wear your Judaism on your sleeve. And when I first started in this industry, probably, or, oh my gosh, 16, my daughter's 16. And I first started writing when she was born. So 16 years ago, and it was always a question of how Jewish should I be? How much should I show? You know, obviously I live an Orthodox lifestyle. How much do I show myself, you know, with a scarf on my head or dressing a certain way? How much do I try to blend in and sort of be just, you know, quick and easy food versus quick and kosher food? Talk to me about that confidence that you have to be so Jewish. I heard you say Shabbat on the Today Show. I've been on the Today Show a hundred times. I'm going to be on on Monday. I've never said, personally, me who keeps Shabbat in like the most authentic way, never said Shabbat on the Today Show. It's it's funny because you you, you brought that up and it was weird. I was just talking to my husband this morning about how insane it was that they asked, it was a recipe for my mother-in-law and they asked for photos. And I really specifically chose a photo of um, mm -hmm. my husband and I signing our ketubah and both of our mothers mm -hmm. as the witness. And mm -hmm. to have a picture on national television of a, queer couple signing a ketubah, mm -hmm. such a, an important act of, of Jewish love mm -hmm. and Jewish community. Mm -hmm. Like how often do you see a ketubah signing on national television? It, it, it right. doesn't happen. And to me, those are the moments that are important, especially as someone who is coming from a place of, just coming from a different place. I, I think this book mm -hmm. was such a, an example. And I say it all the time, I am Jewish. I, it's, the mm -hmm. title is a play on the fact that for, I think one generation above me, it was really common that if you stepped away from any type of tradition, then mm -hmm. you were a bad Jew or you were Jewish, mm -hmm. you were losing part mm -hmm. of your Judaism. And mm -hmm. I've always come from this place that it's such a huge part of my identity. It's such a huge part of mm -hmm. the way I act, the way I cook, the way I interact with my family, my core mm -hmm. values, all of it. Whether I practice things to a T or not. Um, mm -hmm. And for me, this book was this, this, this real deep dive into understanding and learning and loving um, those aspects of, of my identity and my history and my heritage mm -hmm. and figuring out how I was going to make it work on the daily, on the weekly. Mm -hmm. so I, I think right. for this whole group of secular Jews, you have people who, um, who would rather step away from Judaism rather than make it work for them. I, I want Jewish food to be made, I, I think on regular Tuesday, I don't think you have to reserve right. it just for your Passover Seder once a year. Of course not, of course not. We wanna live and breathe this. And food is such a connection to culture and to identity. Um, you look, I think it's a different day and age now than when I started and we weren't able to wear this on our sleeve in such a proud Correct. kind of way. You know, I remember the first time I did like go on was the beginning of social media and I went on again, not with my wig, but with a scarf on my head. And I had someone say to me, like, you shouldn't present yourself that way. And now it's like every time I go on and my as my most authentic self, which is I usually cook with a scarf, you know, like it's yes. everyone loves it and they relate so much more. How how much do you think that plays into how how public you're able to identify with your Judaism based on sort of the media culture now and that sense of authenticity? I think that the media has has really it's done a number on our community in terms of this internalized devaluation of what mm. what Judaism can be, what Jewish food can be. We have like French food, European food is, is fancy, yeah. and, and Jewish food because of the fact that it comes from the shtetl, it's of somehow of lesser value, which it's not. Right, and I think it's the same way of how you you present yourself. If that is your life, 
Mm -hmm. Truly, that is so incredible because you're able to show an entire community that relates mm -hmm. to that. And, and that's the power mm -hmm. of what we do is we're able to relate to people and kind mm -hmm. of bring them into our lives, share our struggles, share our joys, mm -hmm. our celebration. And if people yeah. can see themselves in you, which I mean, mm -hmm. you have such an incredible community of, of, of people who mm -hmm. do just that, like mm -hmm. that's, that's the goal. It's not about anyone else. I always say, I'd rather have a small community of people who truly see eye to eye with me on, on who I am and how I present myself than have millions of followers that all feel lukewarm about me. Oh, so I hear that. And that's, that's, you know, one discussion about, you know, quantity versus quality, but what do you think about in terms of um, education and representation? You know, I, I actually want to host, are you on clubhouse yet, by the way? I am. I am. Okay. So I want to host a clubhouse. I want to host a room after the today show on Monday, because I want to talk about what it means to be Jewish on the national stage. And yeah. it, there's one sense of, obviously people can identify and we want people who are like us to see themselves in us and give them a sense of confidence and pride. But at the same time, it's a wonderful opportunity to educate the rest of the world about what it means to be Jewish and what Jewish people are. Cause we get bad press, a lot of bad press. Israel gets a lot of bad press. So how important do you think that is? How much responsibility do you feel, and is that fair for you to sort of represent all of Judaism? You called your book Jewish. <laughs> yes, that's an ex such an excellent point. I think it's two parts. I don't think any one Jew can represent Jew Jewish culture at all because of the fact that we all have just this different perspective. I am talking mm -hmm. from my experience growing up Ashkenazi in New York in a regular, relatively secular household, mm -hmm. marrying into an, a Persian Iraqi Jewish family. Mm -hmm. The diaspora is so huge. There are communities and dishes and traditions I haven't been able to even touch upon yet. And you could spend your whole life exploring that in the same way that you could spend your whole life studying Torah or any other aspect right. of Jew Jewish culture and, and religion uh, because yeah. it's just so broad and it could be delved into so deep. The responsibility yeah. is you have to remember that there are these, and you know this because you've done it for forever, these gatekeepers that determine what is a value, what gets to go on national television, what gets to be in the magazine. And mm -hmm. I mean, to be quite, fr quite frank, it's like, oftentimes you have a, a, a bunch of people telling you like, oh, it, it, let's not make it so Jewish. Let's make it Jewish light. And yeah, to me, I've, I've, I've gotten to a point where I'm just saying that's unacceptable. I've had mm -hmm. brands come to me. There was, I'm doing this one thing. And, and there was a question about date syrup saying that date syrup was hard to, uh, could be hard to, to, to find. And my response Ceylon was- Ceylon is my favorite, my favorite. It's my favorite. You can get it at every Whole yes. Foods. You could order it online. Yes. And it's a staple for, it's a staple ingredient for Jewish communities across the world. And Correct. if we're doing a Jewish recipe for Passover, I'm going to use it with abandon and not care about that. Because this you is tell not them, for- You say a lot and say That's it. I love it. That's yeah. it. And you know, when the Torah talks about a land of milk and honey, the honey they're talking about is not bees honey, it's date honey. I love that. It's one of my favorite things. Yeah. All that I use, I have it, yeah. I use it every day. Yeah. So talk to me about your exploration of your Judaism through food. For me, also growing up very Ashkenazi, did not grow up religious at all. My grandparents were all Holocaust survivors, though, from Transylvania. My parents are from Transylvania. So they did cook, even though we weren't religious, all the classics. We would drive to their house on Shabbat, but we would eat cholin, so you know, they would make it. And then I come, I marry into my husband's family, and I have a sister-in-law who's Iraqi. She's Kurdish. And so, like, Boom, are like my husband's six three, blonde, and he's eating kharif and kitsitsot <laughs> and kibbe and like and he's introducing it to me. And I'm like, wow. And then we make Aliyah. And I feel like I was Sparty in a past life. And my whole life and outlook has changed. And I still love all my Ashkenazi classics, but I feel like I I, I discovered a whole world, a whole history, and a whole culture of Judaism. At first glance, it's like we're not even from the same were the same people, this is the same thing. And how, how beautiful it was. So what, food was an incredible eye opener to me. And so like you said, world jewelry, what was it like for you? It was the same. I would say this whole thing began when I met my husband and, and mm -hmm. we really realized that, especially for, for, I would say less religious Jews, you have to remember Jewish culture, Jewish food, is one of the main cruxes that we have, that we grow up yeah. with, that we find that connection to. And our definitions of Jewish food were completely different. It's the same rituals, Shabbat, Passover, yeah. uh, break fast, but completely yeah. different menus. And mm -hmm. I think that exploration was so beautiful. And then we turned to Shabbat, which is something that neither of us really grew up having with our families, but mm -hmm. we began to host it as adults as a way to build community. Um, 
focus on such an incredible age old ritual that, that to me, what I found and what I find most rewarding about what I'm able to do for a community of young Jews in New York is really talk about the meaning. I think we grow up like anyone who's been to Hebrew school, even if they quit after their bar mitzvah can tell you the prayers for the, the wine, the candles, the challah off the back of it, like right. truly any time of day they can tell yeah. you that. However, most of the people I knew never really understood the reasons of why we do those rituals. And yeah. when you start to dive in of so much Jewish ritual, yes, there's a lot of value to to the tradition, to the prayers, all that. But when you start to understand like the purpose of it at the table, it becomes so much deeper. And yeah. I, I think so much more beautiful and such an act of self-care, whether mm. you are religious or not, you can just find that connection to something that your families have been doing for generations. I was going to say, why is food so powerful, right? Because some people have either they've chosen themselves for whatever reason to walk away from a more religious lifestyle or they've just been put forward in to a more secular lifestyle. Why are we still holding on to the food? Well, like, why is that the last stand and the identity of being Jewish if, if there's nothing else that the person is practicing? What is the power of food? I wish I can like verbalize it as well. This happened actually last week. A friend of mine came down um, and met me in my lobby and he is, we went to culinary school together, Ashkenazi, his grandparents owned a bakery in Brooklyn, and he has just mm -hmm. began to kind of explore like cooking old school Jewish pastries. And I was giving yeah. him a copy of my book, and we're sitting there, he's talking about the story of, of, of bringing his grandmother back to Germany, to the town where, where she was from for the first time, and going to this mm -hmm. building that her great-great-grandfather had built, and it was a shul that was turned into a, a honey farm, and they, they bought honey that they then served at Rosh Hashanah, and we're both crying in my lobby, and people are staring. Whoa. And it was, it was something that was just, <laughs> I couldn't tell you the reason why we got so emotional, but it was just down to the fact that this is our history. This is the one thing we've lost so much history, so much tradition because of the travesties. And, and again, it's not that far away. My grandmother was a hidden child. My mother-in-law and her family had to flee Iran during the revolution. Uh, hit wow. my, my husband's grandparents obviously had to flee Iraq during the Farhud. Like this is so close and, and for someone who grows up in a secular household to find some kind of deeper connection and understanding of yourself um, in a way that, that is, is so meaningful. I, I think in, in America, you think of, I think of how people will get kind of, I, I think of how I look down at people who say like, oh, well, I'm okay with, with I'm okay with gay relationships, but they just sh shouldn't be so gay in public. Mm -hmm. And then you have to remember that that's how America treats Jews. You could be Jewish, mm -hmm. but just not so Jewish in public. Well, that's what I was saying. That's the whole thing that that you named your book this. Like you're so Jewish. Like you wear it so proudful. It's unbelievable. It's really it's inspiring. It's inspiring to someone like me who I've been told many times, you know, many times to just tone it down. And I have to tell you, my first book when I had the idea, I was a TV producer at HBO, and I did. I become religious, and I decide I want to, you know, stay home and have a family, and actually have a chance of seeing my newborn baby, my daughter. Because usually you work like, you know, twenty four seven, yeah. you know, in the TV industry. And so I decide I'm going to write a cookbook about my experiences of becoming a new bride and becoming kosher, becoming religious. And I signed the book. I wrote the treatment, and I signed the book by my Hebrew name, Hanala. So I'm like, you know, at the time, the first book is called Quick and Kosher Recipes from the Bride Who Knew Nothing. But at that time, I think I called it. Secrets of the, I, I, by then I think I, that was the title. At one time I was playing around with Secrets of the 15 Minute Chef. And then I went to Quick and Kosher and then I wrote Hannah Legeller. And it was a Jewish publisher. And the Jewish publisher said to me, this sounds great, but do you have an English name that you go by? And meaning I had been Jamie my whole life. I just was Hanala for the first time, just writing on the manuscript. And I thought, yeah. I'm living this religious <laughs> lifestyle. I want to be this name. And I was like, I can't believe a Jewish publisher is telling me to go more secular with my name. So, you know, here we are. And it's been time and time and time again. Just don't be so Jewish, you know? And I struggle with, even if I'm going to say Shabbat now, do I say Shabbat? Do I say Shabbos? Like, will people know what Shabbos, you know? Like, yeah, funny things I, like I, that. It, it, it's all part of this journey. And I think the most beautiful part is it's such an individual process of every person is going to be different. And the way that the community treats every single person is always going to be different. And for me, it's just sticking to my connection to my identity and my Judaism. And that is, that's been the most rewarding part of all of this.
I think the mo- that's the most inspiring thing and the greatest takeaway is how much you love being Jewish, how proud you are of being Jewish, how you've public- published a book called Jewish. Anyone can buy it anywhere books are sold, I imagine. Yes. Right. Okay. You can follow Jake. You can see it scrolling below at Jake Cohen on Instagram and TikTok. And it's just been such a joy to cook with you and to talk with you, Jake, and to be part of what I believe is this hopefully a club of people on the national stage who are just sharing love for Jewish food and Jewish pride with the world. So thank you so much, Jake, for coming today to Jerusalem. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Happy Passover. All right, everyone. That was such an amazing show. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Feed Your Soul. would love to hear about what topics, what uh, you'd like us to speak about, and, you know, as it relates to spirituality and food and Judaism and food and how you feed your soul. Um, always, always please leave comments. We didn't have a chance to get to comments today. I'm so sorry, but um, I love what I, when I go back and I read the comments, it just gives me an indication of what you want to see, what you want to cook. Tell us which dishes you want to make. And it's almost Passover. The countdown is here. It's on, but we still have one more episode. We'll be making another Passover classic next week. Coming back to you live Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern. I'm here at the H World Center in the Hall of Notes at one Western Wall Plaza. Wishing you a amazing, what is today? An amazing Wednesday. It's almost Shabbat, so Shabbat Shalom. Good Shabbos, a good Shabbos, whatever you say. It's almost Passover. Wishing you a happy Passover, and I hope to see you next week.